This first lecture is about the science of psychology. What psychology is, much more broadly, is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. So that's what you want to keep in mind as we go across the entire course of the semester. The part that we're going to focus on today in particular is the scientific study part. So a lot of times people want to know, well, isn't psychology just common sense? And to some extent, sometimes some of the findings will seem like that. But as a science, we don't use guesswork or hunches or personal experiences to help build our understanding of human behavior. Instead, we use the scientific method. So in particular, in psychology, these are the steps to conducting research. The first thing you have to do is ask a question and then pose a hypothesis about that question. So for example, if I was interested in understanding what the attitude of BSU football fans um, have, what attitude they have towards the blue turf, that would be my question. And maybe my hypothesis is that I think that BSU football fans like the blue turf. The second thing I would need to do is define the variables. And the variables are the things that you're trying to measure. And so when we define the variables, we're actually going to be creating what we refer to as operational definitions. And an operational definition is the way you define a variable in terms of how you will measure it. So very specifically, how are you going to get data from that particular variable? So as an example, Let's say that we were trying to measure anxiety. There's lots of different operational definitions that we could use for anxiety. One might be heart rate. So we know that when we're more anxious, our heart goes fast. So we could count the beats per minute, the idea being that people who are more anxious would have a higher beats per minute value than people who are less anxious. But either way, we end up with an actual number, and we can do that um, statistics on that number because it's data. Another option is, let's say that we were, had a, a population of people who were smokers, we could count the number of cigarettes that they smoked in an hour. Again, the idea is, is that people who smoke tend to smoke more when they're anxious or nervous than when they're not. Or third, we could simply ask people on a scale of 1 to 10, how anxious do you feel right now? And they would circle one of those numbers, and that would result in a value, a data point, that we could use to run analyses. So again, the idea is, is that you have to come up with specific ways of getting a number. How are you going to get an actual number? So why don't you try? Let's imagine that we were doing a study where we wanted to measure road rage. Go ahead and give this lecture a pause and see if you can come up with any op potential operational definitions. Some of you might have said, well, maybe the number of times that you yell at another person. And that's a good one, but make sure you give it some kind of a timeline. So maybe the number of times you yell in the car within an hour, or the number of times you flip a person off in an hour, or the decibel level of the people's voices they're talking in the car, etc., etc. Or you could simply ask them. You could do a self-report method again and ask them, how angry do you feel in the car? All of those are good options. Not one is better than the other. It's up to the researcher to decide how they're going to do an operational definition. So once we've defined our variables, we next need to partic uh, pick the participants who are going to be in our study. So generally, uh, a population would be ideal to do a study on. A population includes the entire group of the people that you're studying. So if I was going back to my research question of how do football fans, BSU football fans, feel about the blue turf, my population would be every single football fan, not just in Boise, but in the entire world. Realistically, though, probably it's not going to work out for me to measure all of those people across the world. So instead, what we oftentimes do in psychology is we take a sample, which is a small subset of the population. So maybe I measure 50 BSU football fans, or maybe even 500 BSU football fans, or 1,000. Uh, the idea, though, is that it's just a small group. What we want to do is we want to be able to, be able to draw conclusions from that small subset, from our sample, about the population at whole. And in order to do that, that sample needs to be a couple things. The first is it needs to be random. And what that means is that every person in the group has an equal chance of participating in the study. So if you go and just pick the first 40 people who show up at a fo BSU football game to be in your study, that's not random. There might be some biases with those people, because maybe the people who show up early are the people who are very conscientious and uh, plan their day very well so they never run late. Or maybe it's the people who are really hardcore fans. And it's possible that those uh, groups would have some kind of bias about how they felt about the field. So that would not be a random sample. Ideally, what you would want to do is to uh, maybe s have a list of all of the people who are BSU fans and then randomly draw 50 or 500 of those names out and ask them to be in your study. That would be much more random. 
So we've asked a question and posed our hypothesis. We've defined our variables via operational definitions. We've picked our participants, probably a sample that we have collected randomly. Now we need to choose the type of study that we're going to use. There are three types of studies or three types of research in psychology. There's descriptive research, correlational research, and experimental research. So starting with descriptive research strategies, the goal here is simply to describe things how they are. So uh, this oftentimes is done using one of these following methods, uh, the case study, naturalistic observation, the survey, which is uh, what I referred to earlier as self-report. So those are all descriptive research strategies meant to describe how things are. The second kind of strategy is the correlational strategy. And here what we're doing is we're looking at a relationship, hence the name correlation research. So you're trying to see if variable A is related to variable B. Here variables are measured, they're not manipulated. And this is different than the third strategy, which is the experiment, where you're going to be uh, manipulating research variables. So sometimes you'll take data that you collected via the descriptive methods to use to see if things are related. So maybe you did a survey um, or maybe you did some naturalistic observation and collected data and now you're looking to see are there relationships with, with between some of the variables that you had collected data for. So a correlational um, research strategy ends up with what's called a correlation coefficient, and coefficient is another name for number. So this is a number that represents the correlation, or a number that represents the relationship strength. So the, it ranges from a negative one to a positive one. So it tells us two things. The first is it tells us the direction of the relationship. Some correlation coefficients have a positive value, and some have a negative value. A positive value means a positive correlation, and positive correlations are what happens when the two variables you're looking at both go in the same direction. So as one variable goes up, the other variable also goes up, or as one variable goes down, the other variable also goes down. A negative value means you have a negative relationship, and it means that the variables are moving in opposite directions. So as one variable goes up, the other variable goes down, or vice versa. The correlation coefficient also tells us the strength of the relationship. Values that are closer to zero are weak, and values that are either close to negative one or positive one are strong, meaning the relationship is stronger there than it would be around zero. So here is that number line of negative one to positive one, and a couple examples of real life correlations to so get um, some hands on experience thinking about these numbers. So for example, there is a negative 0.6 correlation between the amount of time spent in traffic and good mood scores. So this value tells us two things. First, we look and see that it's negative. That means that this is a negative correlation. As one variable goes up, the other variable goes down. So the more time you spend in traffic, the less good mood score you have. Or, the less time you spend in traffic, the more good mood score you have. Now we look at the value, which is 0.6. It's closer to negative 1 than it is to 0, which means that this is a pretty strong relationship. So we have a strong negative relationship here. See if you can think about what a negative 0.3 here would mean for number of roommates and loneliness score. This is a moderately sized relationship that says the number of roommates you as the number of roommates you has goes up, your loneliness score goes down, or as you have fewer roommates, your loneliness score goes up. Here we have the number of hamburgers eaten and a score on a math test, which is correlated at about zero. That basically means that there is no correlation. Remember, things that are close to zero have little or no real strength. The amount of watching violence on TV and later aggressive behaviors are correlated at about 0.3. So again, this is a moderate sized correlation. And the more you watch violent TV, the more later aggressive behavior a person has. Or the less violent TV watched, the less aggressive behavior had. And one of the strongest correlations you see in the real world is between height and weight, and it's about a positive 0.8. So as height goes up, weight goes up, and as height goes down, weight goes down. 0.8 is a very strong correlation. One thing that you have to be careful about with correlations is that correlation does not mean causation. So thinking about that example of watching violent TV and having aggressive behavior, it's very easy to look at that correlation of positive 0.3 and think, oh, watching TV causes a person to be violent or have aggressive behavior. But we can't say causation here because it's possible it could go the other direction. It's possible that people who are violent happen to watch more violent television. The correlation can't tell us anything about that. We haven't manipulated any variables. We've just measured them and looked to see how they're correlated. 
So what can be concluded then? Well, we can say things like watching violent TV tends to be related to violent behavior, or people who watch violent TV are more likely to engage in violent behavior, or watching violent television is related to violent behavior. But notice that I'm never saying that one causes the other. We can, however, start talking about the word cause when we get to the third research strategy, which is the experiment. In experiment, we're testing cause and effect. And the reason that we're testing a cause and effect is because we as researchers are going to manipulate the variables. And the variables in a research study have specific names. So when we're running an experiment, uh, we have what's called the independent variable. And this is the variable that we will manipulate, often referred to as the IV. And then we have a dependent variable, or the DV, which is measured. We also need to have something called random assignment. And what that means is that who, all, all the people who are going to be in our study, we're going to have to randomly assign them to various conditions. Um, and usually in a study, there's two conditions. There's the experimental condition and the control condition. There can be more, but for sake of simplicity, we'll just look at these two. So let's say that we want to know whether um, watching violent television causes violent behavior. The experimental condition is the group that should receive the quote unquote treatment or should receive the violent television watching. The control condition is the group that receives no treatment, so they shouldn't watch violent television. So as a researcher, what I'm going to be doing is creating these groups, and then I'm going to manipulate whether they get exposed to the violent television or not. And then that's how I have made up situation where I can in the end say something about causation. So let's do this example um, from a pictorial perspective. So does watching violent TV cause violent behavior? So we have a pool of subjects. Let's say here that I'm studying children. So let's say I have 100 children. What I would do is I'd randomly assign them to two conditions. We either have the experimental condition or the control condition. And they're going to be randomly assigned. The reason that random assignment is good is because it will help balance out the groups as best as possible for potential other confounding variables. So maybe I have a handful of kids within my group of 100 that come from a violent household. And coming from a violent household might actually cause you to be more violent. But if I randomly assign them, then hopefully the number of violent kids in each of the groups, each of the conditions, will be about equal. So through random assignment, a few should go to the experimental group and if you should go to the control group and they'll balance each other out. Now we have the independent variable. This is the part that I'm going to manipulate. So remember that the experimental condition gets the quote unquote treatment and the control condition does not. So in both situations I'm going to have the group watch three hours of TV a day. The experimental group is going to watch three hours of violent TV. The control group is going to watch three hours of non-violent TV. The reason that I'm having them both watch TV is because maybe there's something about TV that actually causes violence, whether it's Sesame Street or Pokemon. But I don't know that, so I have to hold everything between the two groups as constant or as the same as possible. So they should all be uh, watching the same amount of television, they should all be in similar rooms, they should all have doing it, be doing it at the same time of the day, etc. because we want to control for any biases. Then I'm going to measure the outcome variable, which here is how violent are they. So maybe I go and watch them on the playground and see, record how many times each child hits other kids. And let's say that in the experimental condition, the children who watch the three hours of violent TV on average hit other kids four times during recess, while the control condition who didn't watch violent TV only hit each other one time on average at recess. So I have a difference between the two groups. And because I've done an experiment where I've carefully controlled everything possible except the one variable I want to study, in this case watching violent television, I can say that because my differences are caused by the variable that I manipulated. So I can say watching violent TV causes more violent behavior from this experiment. So once we've chosen the type of study, either a descriptive study, a correlational study, or an experimental study, we would then go ahead and actually conduct the study, followed by using the data from that study to make conclusions about the hypothesis. And then we would go back and start all over again. Either we would have a hypothesis that wasn't supported and we needed to make some changes, or maybe our hypothesis was supported but we had further questions to ask. So science is a cyclical process that's always going on and on and on. So that's how we know what we know about behavior and mental processes. These are the techniques that all of the research we cover across the entire semester is going to be based on.